Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. Today's guest is Andy Serafim. Andy is my first physical therapist ever to talk to. There's really good knowledge about being a younger player and a teenage player. Thank you so much, Andy, for your time, and I enjoyed it a lot. Earlier this summer, I got connected with Andy Serafin, today's guest. Andy was starting to develop his online coaching platform and wanted to work with a few athletes to try it out. I jumped in and appreciated the opportunity to get feedback from him and design a program. Andy earned his white coat from Duke this past year and also studied at Temple University. He posts a number of great exercises and explanation of injuries and other content on his Instagram. I'd like to give you a few moments to fill in any gaps to your introduction. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, what's going on, everyone? Thank you, Anna, for having me on the podcast today. Uh, you pretty much hit it all. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, born and raised there. Um, I went to Temple University for my undergrad, and I graduated with a degree in kinesiology, which is very similar to exercise science. And I'm currently in my final year of physical therapy school at Duke University, and I will be graduating in about six months. So pretty excited. In this podcast, Keep the Game Beautiful, each week I start with the same few questions. So first, what does the beautiful game mean to you? For me, I think the beautiful game, if anything, it, it really starts with a mindset of just simply enjoying yourself and having a good time. And for me, that's the one thing that stays constant from skill level to skill level as you go up or down in age. It really should really just be about having a good time, um, healthy competition with your friends, with your teammates, and enjoying yourself while you're getting a good workout in. So that's really what makes the game beautiful to me. Um, other people will probably say, yes, yeah, some like, like if you go up into the higher skill levels, that's more beautiful. But I like to really keep it simple. What does everything have in common for regardless of skill level, regardless of age? And for me, it's everybody having a good time. So that's what mm -hmm. I think is beautiful about our game. And it's also helpful when you're working out and having fun. This is true. Yep. Two for one right there. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? So as a uh, physical therapy student and strength and conditioning coach, I have the pleasure to work with athletes to make them stronger, make them faster and keep them healthy. And for me, part of in my own personal philosophy, one of the things that is also beautiful about the game is having everybody healthy. That way they can be on the field having a good time. So for me, I like to keep the athletes healthy, make them stronger and faster. So that way, when they're on the field, they can play at their best. Mm -hmm. How do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful? I mean, it all comes down to building relationships with athletes in general. Um, if you have an athlete, you just have to build a strong personal connection with them before you move into more of the training and, and strength and conditioning aspects of it. Because one of the things you have to do to encourage others is have that relationship that will give you the foundation to build on top of. Um, so first I encourage others by building a relationship with them and then showing them the positives of doing things such as strength and conditioning to improve their abilities on the field. Now let's talk about football physios. How did you come up with this idea? So it actually started, I started this page my first year of PT school, and I actually got started by covering football injuries, as in American football. And my first injury that I covered was um, Odell Beckham Jr. when he broke his leg. And I kind of used that on a separate page where I was just talking about healthcare in general. And a few people reached out to me and said, hey, this is really cool. Um you should do this for all sports. And I started to do that at first and then it was kind of tiring. So what I ended up doing is I said, I'm going to focus on the game that I love, which is soccer. And I'm just going to post soccer injuries. 
And after a while, people started messaging me saying, hey, how do I avoid these injuries? So then I said, okay, I'll make some exercises. I'll post some tips, um, things along those lines. And then after a while, people really started to catch on to it and enjoying the content I put out. So, yeah. Was it easy to decide what sport to focus on or did it challenge you for a little bit? I would say for me personally, it was pretty simple in terms of strictly social media. Soccer is a sport that I already enjoy watching that I'm watching already. So it doesn't require too much extra work to keep track of the injuries and this and that. When it comes to training individuals in person as in strength and conditioning, um, There's a lot of focus, I think, in our world right now of being very sports specific. So having, quote unquote, soccer specific exercises. But in reality, 90% of athletes need the same basic exercises to become better physically. So although on my page, everything is framed in a soccer specific mindset, um, in general, it is applicable to any athlete. Where does your passion for soccer come from? This is a question that I kind of catch myself asking myself sometimes. Um, I mean, I played soccer ever since I was little. I was five or six years old, but I always played at the recreational level. I never played at a club or a a collegiate um, level like that. I kind of just always played around in my community at the grassroots level, and I was involved in my local rec team. And that continued and has continued thus far. I mean, I played recreationally at Temple and Duke as well. And I also play pickup in my time while I'm on clinical rotations. So, I mean, I, I love and enjoy playing the game. Um, I could say that at times when I was younger, there were times that I didn't enjoy it as much, but I think that ever since I've figured out a way to merge what I'm learning in school and what I'm doing on the pitch, that's really where, my passion for the game has come from because in school, all we're learning is learning about how to make people healthier, how to make them stronger. And I get to apply it with soccer players on the field. Now, I don't think I've really asked you this yet, but how did you decide you wanted to pursue a medical career? Um, so ever since I was little, most people in my family, they're, um, they're in the medical field. My mom is a nurse. My dad's a pharmacist. So I was kind of surrounded by it since I was a kid. And um, when I was going through looking at what type of healthcare provider I wanted to be, I focused on two things. One, I wanted to do something in orthopedics, meaning I wanted to work with um, muscles and bones as opposed to, uh, let's say, like neurology or uh, gastrointestinal, that type of stuff. I wanted something physical where I can actually physically see the body parts moving see what the problem was and have a physical solution. My second point that I really wanted to focus on was spending time with my patients. As most people know, if you go to a, if you go to a physician, their schedule is slam packed. And if they're lucky, they'll be able to see you for 10, 15 minutes, uh, maybe once every other month, if if you're struggling with some sort of issue. Um, But in physical therapy, it's very different in the fact that we get to spend 30 minutes to an hour with our patients multiple times per week. And that was the one thing that really set physical therapy apart in my mind, and which is why I decided to pursue it as a, as a career. Now, knowing you wanted to focus a little bit more on soccer athletes, were you able to focus your studies a little bit more? Yes, to, to a degree, yeah. I mean, I think that kind of how most exercises are made for any athlete are not very soccer specific. I would say that the rehabilitation process is similar up until the end. So although I am very focused on soccer, um, what we're learning at school can really be applied to not only most athletes, but most humans in general. So it's, it's really the same rehab principles that we're using regardless of who it is we're treating. And we just fine tweet, uh, we like fine tune the process if someone is an athlete that needs to go back to a, a competitive venue. Now, you said training for different sports is almost the same. Do you find any more, like, difference? Um, I would say there – let's put it this way. If you have an athlete who is a soccer player 
and you have another athlete who let's say is completely different tennis uh hockey uh football i would say at the base level their programming is probably about 85 percent identical if it's done correctly uh, mostly because there are very foundational movements that every athlete needs to focus on, such as the squat, the push, the pull, the press, the lunge, the brace. All of those are very foundational movements that every single athlete needs to improve to get their abilities on the field better. Um, so that's why I, in my opinion, they're, they're going to be almost the same, where the individual characteristics come into play is, okay, I have a soccer player who is in the fall season and is going into spring season starting in January and has trained for this X amount of years and plays this position. Once you get all those other variables, that is much more within the process as compared to just simply saying soccer versus football or soccer versus baseball or soccer versus Mm -hmm. hockey. Um, Most sports really, they, they share much more than people realize. Why is it having a personalized strength and conditioning plan important? So it's important because the whole purpose of a strength and conditioning program is to get the athlete stronger and keep them healthy. And if you think about it, everybody is at a different level of strength. Everybody's at a different level of speed and everybody is in a different state of health. So if everybody is different, then every program needs to be individualized to those differences. That being said, in a sport such as soccer, in any team sport, really, you won't always have the ability to individualize everything, which is why it's important to have options within any workout to scale it to any ability level. In those environments, it's not always going to be perfect, but imperfect action is better than not taking it at all. When you design personalized programs, what are some questions you have for athletes? So my first question always is, where are you at in in your season? Because that is going to dictate a lot of the programming. For example, if you're in the preseason, say you're in the week before um, your tryouts or whatever, and you hit up a strength and conditioning coach, and you're like, hey, I want to get stronger, I want to get faster – and tryouts are next week, well, there's not much we can do to help you. Versus if you're in the off season, you have a lot more options compared to in season, all you're trying to do is maintain everything that you've worked to achieve thus far. So I like to ask where they're at in the, pre, uh, in the season's phase. Um, I like to ask how old they are, um, what their personal goals are, as in do they want to focus on speed or endurance or strength or agility? I like to ask physical characteristics, so how tall they are, how much they weigh, um, what type of body composition they're currently in. Um, And another very important one at the high school and collegiate level is what type of fitness test do they have you doing for when you come back to play in the beginning of the season. It's not very applicable, but many coaches have players doing like a two-mile test when they start the season. We need to make sure that we pass those tests when we return so that way you're able to show all of your abilities on the field so yeah I I think that pretty much covers I like to do age um, as well position that you play how long does it take you to design or modify the programs you make longer than most people think Um, a lot of people think it's kind of just write down a few exercises and if you want it to be that way it can but if, it, if the program is going to be individualized to all of those variables that we just talked about, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. You have to take into consideration so many factors that we could talk about. It, t- it, it take a while to get into. But I would say on average for a four-week training block, about an hour and a half to two hours. How do you help athletes to set out accountability mi- milestones? So accountability, it's something that, in my opinion, the athlete, it's almost a prerequisite to strength and conditioning. If the athlete wants to physically get stronger and faster, then accountability really won't be an issue. 
if they're not accountable, they probably won't reach out to you in the first place. But in my opinion, it's a prerequisite. And it's something that needs to be, it's something that has to be innate before you start this process. Now, I can certainly encourage it. So having objection, uh, having um, objective measures throughout the training process really helps to solidify that. So for example, let's say you're coming into season and you have a two mile test. So what I'll do is the first week of our training session, we'll do that test and say, hey, we need to get it under 12 minutes. Right now we're at 14. And then six weeks later, we'll do it again. Now we got to 13 minutes. So that shows progress. And if the athlete sees progress, they'll be more likely to stick with any program. Why is it important to vary exercises depending on goals? So when goals change, our, our, the whole reason we, we measure goals is to pull out what the athlete truly thinks is important. So let's say an athlete wants to become faster and they set that as a goal. Now as a strength and conditioning coach, that gives me more information to say, hey, let's do speed, let's do agility drills, let's do acceleration drills. So that way you can improve in the goal that you set. So you make a goal, you make it a priority, and I have, the, as the coach, have the ability to tweak the exercises to give you what you want in the end. Are there some goals that are more important for certain positions? I would say my, my big answer to this is going to be most likely not. Um, like we previously talked about how different sports have quote unquote specialization within the sport of soccer. Now we're starting to see, oh, here's a program for forward versus, oh, here's a program for, for midfielders and defenders and keepers. Um, the one difference that I will say is the, the training for a keeper should be pretty different. But in reality, field players, they often have very, very, very similar um, goals on the field in terms of physical performance. So yes, you're going to have slight variations in the number of sprints and the number of kilometers covered and the number of accelerations, decelerations from position to position. But in reality, they're really hitting almost the same numbers. So because of that, it's more important that they're getting in the weight room and they're doing their sprints on the pitch and hitting everything in general before you start to say, hey, I want to make my forwards do, um, let's say, 10 sprints instead of eight this week. Versus, hey, I want my midfielders to add three minutes to their endurance compared to everyone else this week. You can definitely focus on that, but I think building the foundation of showing up in the gym and on the pitch should come first. Now, we know a soccer player will use their leg muscles. What would you say to a player about the importance of also working on fitness of other areas in the body? I would say soccer is a full body sport, um, and you need to train every muscle in your body to try to improve that. So, I mean, everybody knows that the muscles of the leg are super important in soccer. The core is very important, too. You need core stability um, throughout the match to make sure that you're strong and stable with every moment, every motion that you do. If your core isn't stable, that means your legs aren't moving as efficiently as they could be. Now we also use our arms in soccer too. You as a keeper definitely know that. Mm -hmm. So we need to train those as well. And um, we also use our arms when we're sprinting. If we use our arms when we're sprinting, we can get to the ball faster. Um, we can win more challenges and we can hopefully win more games. So we need to really focus on training the entire body as a soccer player. It's very important. Why is it important to keep your neck strong? So your neck needs to be strong because it's part of your body. And I would consider your neck part of your core because it attaches to your spine. I would say that in, as it relates specifically to the neck, it's part of your body that we use in soccer, right? So we use our neck when we're going up for headers and this and that. Our neck needs to be strong and we need to train it so that way we're in, when we're in those situations, we can come out safely. There are a few studies out there that correlate um, neck strength and concussion risk. And the results right now pretty much say that 
if your neck is strong going into any sort of challenge and you see the challenge coming, you're less likely to get a concussion, but that doesn't hold true in every situation. So I would consider, I would pretty much answer that by saying your neck is part of your body. And as you're getting stronger throughout your upper body, your neck will be stronger as well. How does being a multi-sport athlete help? So it helps a ton in terms of allowing the athlete to stay active year round without putting too much stress on the body. A lot of youth athletes these days, they play year round with one club or one team or whatever. And when any human being goes into any action that is extremely repetitive over a long period of time, you're at risk for a chronic injury, especially if you're not varying the movements and you're not taking time off, which is what soccer players in America often do. We play year round. Um, we play with the same team doing the same exact movements year after year after year. When in reality, what we should be doing is changing the movements up. So let's say a soccer player decides to, in the off season, go play basketball, right? So now you're having completely different movements. You're learning completely different patterns and you're still working on things like endurance, coordination, all those things, which are very important. So I think it really does help and it exposes the athlete to different environments, right? So let's say someone plays like attacking midfield or a number 10 for a soccer team. If you think about it from a tactical perspective, that is almost the equivalent of playing quarterback for a football team or playing point guard on a basketball team. So even though you're changing sports, you're still working on acceleration, deceleration, you're still working on speed, you're working on being able to think at a high level under pressure. And we're doing that while changing the movements up, which will allow us to be healthier in the long run. Do you think there's one sport that might help soccer players most in the off season? Ooh, if I had to pick one, first of all, it would not be futsal, which is almost the, the exact replica of football, soccer. Um, I would say... I would say basketball. And I say that because one, it's fast paced. Two, it's very, very tactically driven by the coach. Three, it's very easy to get into because you can just go out and play in the community with friends. And four, it involves you thinking at a high level under a very, very time driven environment. So in basketball, just like soccer, you don't have a lot of time in between plays or, or anything like that to think of what you got to do. You have to do it on the fly. And it trains you to have control in an environment that is very congested. And we see that on the soccer field. So I'm a big fan of basketball. It's my second favorite sport. Um, so I would say, yeah, go play basketball. What do you believe are some of the biggest challenges facing youth, high school, and college athletes? I would say that from my own bias perspective, the biggest challenge is staying healthy and um, getting faster and stronger. It, other, other than that, you know, you have the whole pay for play system, which challenges U.S. soccer at a extremely high level. If you look in comparison to other countries, financially, soccer went from a grassroots sport to a sport that is played by almost exclusively the wealthy at the DA and academy levels. I think that that would be the biggest challenge as it relates to soccer as a whole in America. But from my own perspective, I think just getting players to buy into the fact of increasing their physical strength and their speed and how, how that can correlate with them improving on the field. Now, going back to being a multi-sport athlete just a little bit, what's an overuse injury? So an overuse injury essentially is a, any injury that is the result of too much load or too much exercise in a very, very short time period. And that can be looked at a, as a few different ways. So like, let's say somebody that never, ever plays sports goes out and plays soccer for two hours one day and they pull their hamstring. Technically, that is considered an overuse injury because they weren't used to that load. Now, let's take someone who plays soccer every week 
and practices three times a week, get two games a week, and then um, does like training in, in his off days or whatever. If you keep that same environment for, let's say, four years, like a college or a high school athlete, and you're not changing up the movements, now you're putting yourself at risk if that exercise is not dosed properly. Do you find you have a lot of athletes hurt as a result of overuse injuries? I would say in soccer, yes. But that being said, it's not something that you can always control. For example, if you play for a team, um, and let's take the NCAA, for example, a lot of their athletes, they play on Friday and then they play again on Sunday. A lot of those injuries are going to be, quote unquote, overuse because they're playing at an, at an intense level twice in such a short time period. So, yeah, I would say the majority of injuries are actually overuse. Traumatic injuries that are a result of collisions with either another player or the ground, those really, they do happen in our game, but they're less common. What would you say to a player or a coach that is trying to return to the pitch too soon or play through an injury? I would say that it depends on their goals. If we're, if we're working to get a full and complete recovery for any athlete, it needs to be focused on their individual goals. Now, the problem with that is individuals play for teams. And the individual goals and the team goals might not always align. So let's take an example of a soccer player who sprains his ankle and has a game in three days, right? In the athlete's long-term, in the athlete's long-term, I guess, career, you have to say, okay, where are we at currently? Now, let's say the athlete is going to go play uh, recreationally on the weekend. Well, then we're not going to play. Well, let's take that same athlete and say, okay, the World Cup finals in three days. Well, then they're going to play. So you have to see if the individual and team goals align. And if they do or do not, that's really what's going to dictate the process of when you return and how quickly. How much rest time should players take between exercising or playing games? So this is also a it depends answer too. Um, It depends on how accustomed the player is to playing so often, right? So let's say you have um, an athlete at the beginning of the season, they're going to need more rest in between games because they're not used to playing every week versus at the end of the season, they can likely get away with just a little bit less rest because they're very conditioned from playing the entire year. Um, It also depends on injury history and um, current rehab and injury status. But in general, you need about 72 hours for a complete and full recovery in between workouts. You also have to think of how much I need to improve on the pitch and on the field. Because if we have a a very large gap that we need to improve on, we're obviously going to have to train more frequently and more and more consistently. So in general, you do need two to three days to fully recover but you don't need to be in a state of full recovery to perform at a high level. For multi-sport athletes or people with a lot going on, how can they find time to recover and rest? So I would say that recovery is 90% sleeping eight hours a night, eating a proper meal after the game, and staying hydrated. If you have time for those three things, then you will have a good recovery. If you do not have time for those three things, then you need to reevaluate and see what you can shift around in your life to get those three things. And it's pretty much as simple as that. Now, going back about what you said about nutrition, how important is nutrition? So I prefer to use the term, instead of nutrition, I like to use the term fuel. Because if you think of food as fuel, I think that puts you in the right mindset to really improve your diet. Because fuel is what, like, let's say you have a car, right? Fuel is what gets that car to move forward. Just like you as a human, nutrition is fuel for your body. Um, So it's super important in the fact that everything that you put into your body is going to determine your performance, not only on the field, but throughout your life in general. 
How does an athlete know they're getting the fuel they need? I would say, you know, you can really, you can try to track your diet with things like MyFitnessPal and see your, your macros and as in how much like protein, carbs, and fat you're intaking. Um, but I like to just go off of how you feel. Um, there are very detailed stats you can get into, but honestly, I like to go by how you feel that day. Um, if you're hydrated, um, and what your performance on the pitch is like, and that's what I like to go off of personally, but, uh, I'm sure there's, um, a ton more you can do with that. If you speak with a, like a registered dietitian or nutritionist. Are there particular foods or favorite tips you like to promote? I always like to emphasize what the importance of a good breakfast can do for you on match day. So a lot of players have matches, especially at the youth level, on the weekends. And um, it's super important to make sure that when you have a early match, you have to eat a breakfast that is not only dense in nutrients and carbohydrates and protein, but it also can't weigh you down. And finding that tricky spot in the middle is tough to do the first thing in the, mor in the morning. So my breakfast of choice uh, before a match is always two to three pancakes and one to two links of sausage. And that will give me the carbs and the protein I need for the match. Um, I also like to make sure that everybody stays hydrated at all times throughout the week and not just on match days. Is it important to hydrate after competition or training? Absolutely. And any player can actually measure this after a practice where if you, let's say you step on a scale right before practice, you can write down that weight. Now, after your practice, go weigh yourself again, and you will be surprised about how much water weight you lost by just playing soccer for an hour or two. You can sometimes lose, if you're a bigger guy like myself, um, there have been sessions where I've lost about six or seven pounds of weight before and after training. And that's just water. And that water needs to be replaced um, before you start your next session. I'm lucky that I've never had to miss a game due to a physical injury. But I know players my age in their early teens have had significant injuries and even surgeries. Sometimes injuries are unavoidable and will happen. But how often do you think they could be reduced or avoided with proper training? I would say the vast majorities that we see in soccer could potentially be avoided with physical conditioning. Um, if we improve the strength of every muscle in our body, we're at less risk for physical injury. Um, now, there are some injuries that you just can't, you can't get around. So if you, if you look at the NFL, for, for example, those are some of the fastest and strongest human beings on the planet. And they have an insane amount of injury just because of the nature of their sport. Um, now, our, our sport isn't as visibly violent, I guess you could say. But there are some injuries that you can't avoid. But for the ones that you can, you really have to say, okay, how do I, how do I prevent this? And it's proven through scientific research that becoming stronger can significantly decrease your risk of injury. How can coaches and teams improve their strength and, strength and conditioning or warm-up programs? I would say first is it comes down to mindset. The mindset of the players and the team has to be in a state of acceptance and willingness when it comes to warming up. Um, you see it all the time where coaches either treat warm up, warming up as something that isn't very serious or is optional when it should really not only be a requirement, but it should be something that is enjoyed. And if you have a good strength and conditioning coach, the warm-up is something that can definitely be enjoyed through fun activities. Um, so I would say it really comes down to the coaches creating the culture of having a good warm-up program. So that way the players, when they first are introduced to the game at the grassroots level, see it as a necessity. Players don't always understand the importance of preseason workouts. What would you tell a player that doesn't think strength training is important? I would say that if you look at workouts in the preseason, 
um, they are specifically designed to get you faster and stronger. Once the season starts, your main goal shifts to keeping at the same level you achieved while training in the preseason. So let's say you're working on your squat and in your off season, your squat jumps from 45 pounds to 135 pounds, right? Once the season starts, all you're trying to do is either keep it at that 135 or slightly increase it. Once you're in season, you probably don't have the time to spend in the gym um, increasing that. And if you do have the time, it should probably be spent on improving the more technical aspects of your game. Um, So I would say that the majority of your progress is going to be made in the preseason. Once season starts, you should be looking to maintain what you've already improved on. How much should athletes be doing outside of practice during the season? This is another tricky question to answer because it's going to depend on how the season is set up for that athlete. So if an athlete has four competitive fixtures in one week, they probably, regardless of level, they probably aren't going to be doing anything outside of that. Now, if you have an athlete that plays once or twice a week, then you can definitely be in the gym two days a week working on speed, working on strength. I would say that ideally you would like to be in the gym at least once. I would say at least once, hopefully twice per week while you're in season to maintain those strength gains. And then once you're out of season, you can be in the gym more frequently three to four times a week. What would you say to someone who is resistant to train for fear of being too bulky? This is a very complex question and Getting bulky as a soccer player is very difficult, mostly because when we're the metabolic demands of our game on the field, um, we're going to burn a ton of calories. That's just how it's going to, how it's going to happen that for you to become bulky, what you need to do is consume more calories than you're burning. And if you're training soccer wise, you're going to be burning probably close to six, 800 calories every training session, depending on your size. Now, if a lot of, a lot of concerns in this area come from the female side of the game, where you have female athletes who say they don't want to get too bulky, um, that also isn't going to happen as well due to the hormonal nature of the female athlete. So becoming bulky, it's very, very difficult to do. That statement is hard to believe, But if you want to really learn how difficult it is to get bulky, ask a football player and ask them what has to happen for them to gain 20 pounds. And you'll get, you'll be able to see that it's a lot harder to become bulky than, than you think. If a person is just getting started and doesn't know exercises, how can they start? So they can start first by reaching out to a strength and conditioning specialist that can help them throughout that process. Um, That's not always an option which is when they can reach out to their soccer coaches who hopefully have some sort of background in that field. Um, If that's not an option, they can reach out to teammates and see if they have any ideas. And if that's not an option, you can go on the internet and see what you can go to a trusted resource, such as my page or any other coach's page and see what kind of movements you can do. Now, as you go from that first, I would say top tier of reaching out to a strength and conditioning specialist versus going down, down, down until you're down on the internet, the, the quality that you're going to get is likely going to be diminished and it's not going to be specific to you, the athlete. Um, so just be mindful of that as you're reaching out to people in general. Are there a few exercises that people can do right now with no equipment? There are a ton of exercises you can do with no equipment And the basic movements um, of squat, pull, press, lunge, brace, you can do every single basic movement without any body weight or without any external load at all. You can do it with just your body weight. So you can do things like body weight squats. You can do push-ups. You can do uh, tuck jumps. You can do so many exercises without equipment. And honestly, working out without equipment is one of the things that I like to incorporate in my program the most 
because I know that the athlete can do it anywhere and at any time. So from a realistic standpoint, um, doing uh, workouts without equipment is much more easier to implement in a in an athlete's program than working out with equipment. I saw that you released your first podcast only a few weeks ago. What do you hope people learn from these? So I started a podcast called The Soccer Fitness Experience with um, another physical therapist who lives in Boston. Who lives in Boston? Um, his name is Berg, and all we do is put out fitness tips for soccer players. And me and Berg, through both of our Instagram pages, we get a ton of questions about how to stay fit, how to stay healthy, how to reduce injury. And all we do is answer the questions that we are sent the most. Um, so we actually just recorded a podcast episode um, on how to train in the cult. And these are questions that, you know, players often have questions about, you know, and through our podcast, all we're doing is keeping it very simple and educating players about the physical aspect of the game. Are you planning on continuing to record podcasts in the future? And what types of topics do you want to cover? So yeah, we, we record on a weekly basis and we release them on Spotify and iTunes every week. And as far as I know, we're gonna continue to do it as long as we can. Um, mostly because we have no short of questions that players ask us. And as both of us, as professionals grow, we will be able to answer the questions better and better. So we're going to keep on going. Um, we're going to cover every single topic that anybody ever wants us to cover. Um, if people send us questions all the time, and our kind of thing is, well, if you ask a question, we'll make the time to answer it. Now we've made it to our last question. This is the question I always end with. What do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world? Ooh, this is a deep one. I like this one. Um, I would say I want player, every player that I encounter, I want them to be able to participate in the game of soccer their entire life. Um, and I, I kind of look at this as a very big picture, almost like a life question, because on the field talent, it doesn't, it doesn't last forever. Um, you can play at like, let's say, let's take even Leo Messi, right? Best player in the world. By the time he's in his, he's already close to his mid thirties now, by the time he gets to 40, he's not going to be good enough to play at that level. Now, how can he still stay involved in the game? You know, he could be a coach. Um, he could be a referee. Um, he could become a, a tactical academy instructor. He can do so much to still stay involved in the game, right? Do the things that he sees as what makes the game beautiful, right? So in my instance, right, I still play on the field every day, but I also stay involved in the game by helping athletes get stronger and staying healthy. And I can do that forever. So I would tell the athlete, what can you do forever in this sport, regardless of physical ability? Um, that's what I want you to really latch on to and take hold of throughout your, your, your playing career. Thank you so much for your time, Andy. It was a great time talking to you. No problem. It was a pleasure to, to be on the podcast. What a great talk with Andy. I encourage you to go check out his page, The Football Physios. There's some great knowledge, and like I said before, there's some great injury analysis. I hope you learned a lot about the hydration and nutrition of players and how important being hydrated is. I also know we talk about overuse and recovery. And until I see you next week, remember to keep the game beautiful.